much for reminding me that. Sorry. No worries. Jim, thank you so much for reminding me that I have a paying job. Um, it can be easy to forget that this time of year uh, because shorebirds are on the ground. And many of you know, it's very difficult for me to stay away uh, from Eagle Bluffs, particularly when shorebirds are on the ground. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you tonight about uh, one of my real passions, um, not just birds, but shorebirds in particular. I will share my screen. And we're off. Uh, you all know all, all of that information already, uh, except perhaps my email address. If you've got any questions related to this presentation or want to reach out to me, otherwise, feel free to do so at that address. Uh, I do also want to say some thank yous. Uh, first, to Columbia Audubon Society, particularly to Nancy Bedan, Jim Gast, John Besser, Eric Wood, uh, also to the Missouri Birding Society, in particular to Edge Wade. Uh, to the Missouri Bird Records Committee and to Missouri eBird. I want to start, uh, thank all my birding friends and mentors, many of whom are uh, present in the Zoom. And uh, in particular, uh, my two birding mentors, uh, Paul McKenzie and Brad Jacobs. Uh, we are uh, less than two weeks away from the second anniversary of Brad's death. Um, I'm finding that it is uh, a good time in the spring to remember his passion, his generosity, and his humor. Shorebirds. A lot of the photos that I take look like that one. I just don't put them up on either. And uh, what have we got there? Well, it's a wetland full of shorebirds. Uh, it's one of the most exciting things for me. Imagine that these birds are coming from many of them, uh, Argentina uh, and uh, other areas in South America, and some of them are flying 8,000 miles to the Arctic, sometimes at an altitude of 10,000 feet. So these birds are seeing our wetlands and they're dropping down into them because they are food rich sites. Uh, and they're lingering there for a while to build up their energy stores so they can continue their migration north to breed. Uh, and when something that exciting is happening, uh, when there's such a wildlife spectacle going on just a few miles from us, I have trouble, one, you know, I just wonder, how could you do anything else but want to see that? Um, and it keeps me very busy. Sometimes the birds take off, uh, as you know, they do that often, and this can be very exciting. I like to take these pictures because birds uh, can be identifiable in this pose, and you can look at them retrospectively and uh, you can see uh, what you might have missed. Um, now, this photo is primarily pectoral sandpiper, uh, but there's something weird there. And I know this photo is small on your screen. Uh, let, me just, let me blow it up. This, in fact, is the uh, curly sandpiper that Paul McKenzie and I found early uh, last April. Um, how do you know it's a curly sandpiper? Well, you see that wing stripe there? Uh, Dunlin would also have that. Uh, you see that long decurved bill? Of course, the Dunlin would also have that. If you see them uh, in a perched state, it does look quite different. Um, but there's something here that a Dunlin does not have, which is an all white rump. And on a Dunlin, you would see a split in the rump similar to what you're seeing in the pectoral sandpipers there. Uh, I um, suspected we might have had a curly sandpiper, but wasn't sure. Got home looked at these photos, and there you go. Uh, it is so exciting to find rarities like this. Um, and it's certainly one of the reasons that we go bird and shore birding in particular, but it's not the only reason. Um, it's just so exciting to be out there this time of year. Here's a photo of the rough that Diane Brickmont and I found uh, at Eagle Bluffs three years ago. This bird did present initially some identification challenges for us, um, and it was quite distant. Uh, the photo here is uh, by Bill Palmer. So let's start at the beginning. What is a shorebird? 
Uh, they belong to the um, order graduate formings, which also includes gulls, terns, and more, also alcids. And in Missouri, we've got representative from, from three families of shorebirds, uh, Recurva rostridae, uh, which are still in Avocet, uh, Caradriidae, which are our clovers, and Scolopacidae, which uh, is uh, a large family of everything else. These birds vary widely in leg size, le or, excuse me, in size, leg length, bill shape, and feeding behavior. In Missouri, if you can believe it, we've had 43 or 44 total species. Uh, and one of those, the uh, Eskimo curlew is extinct. 34 of those species we see annually in Missouri. Uh, most of these birds spend uh, the majority of their time near water. Most are long distance migrants. So when we see them, they're stopping over at food rich sites. Only five of the shorebird species that uh, we have reported in Missouri are actually known to breed here. Um, one of those is American Avocet, which was reported breeding here just very recently. I wonder if you know what the others are. Um, two of them are, I think would probably come to mind rather quickly. Uh, one of them of course is killdeer uh, and the other is American woodcock. Uh, but then we have two uh, species in Missouri that have bred here uh, that may not come to mind so quickly. One of those is spotted sandpiper and uh, spotted sandpiper probably breed in Missouri every year. Uh, a few years ago, Brad Jacobs and I found a breeding pair of spotted sandpiper at Mark Twain Lake that was very exciting. Uh, and the other one is, uh, we haven't had any recent records, but uh, in the Northwest of the state, Wilson's fowl rope. Uh, these birds are uh, primarily insectivorous and uh, most often they nest in scrapes in the ground. Uh, and that is most often, of course, quite north of us. Um, the young are precocial, meaning that they can feed themselves uh, right after they're born. And they depart the breeding ground after adults, which is why in the fall, uh, we see adult shorebirds coming back through starting around July 15th. Uh, and uh, a few weeks later, we start to see the juveniles. So I had to make some hard choices regarding the scope of this presentation. I can't take you through uh, 43 species of shorebird. We just don't have enough time. Um, but I started off being ambitious. It just wasn't gonna work. And I ran into Edge at Eagle Bluffs yesterday. And I said, Edge, I'm having a problem. Um, I was halfway through my presentation and it's 46 minutes long. Uh, and I need to cut it drastically. And I assure you that I have. Um, it's still probably a little fuller than it needs to be. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. Uh, I did uh, want to include rarities, but I haven't decided, in fact, to cut most rare shorebirds. And what I've decided to focus on, especially, are birds that uh, we are likely to see uh, on the field trip that Jim mentioned on Saturday. So it's just not going to happen. Um, and the charge that I was given here was a presentation for beginning birders and those with moderate experience. So. I'll give you some introductory material, move through annually occurring spring uh, calidrids, tringa sandpipers, spotted sandpiper, dowager, and snipe. Uh, I am not going to get to clovers, um, for which I apologize. I'm also not going to talk about uh, stilt or avocet. Uh, I did make a last minute editorial edition that's not represented here. I do want to talk about Wilson's fowler. Uh, we are likely to see that species on Saturday and uh, I got a text from Paul McKenzie uh, a few hours ago telling me that he has, uh, or he had 30 Wilson's Fowler up at Eagle Bluffs this evening. Be glad to do a follow-up. I'm also not gonna talk about counting large number of shorebirds, but if you wanna ask me about that or anything else uh, that's not covered in the presentation, um, I'd be happy to uh, take questions on those topics. We need to talk about parts of a shorebird. Uh, I'm only gonna go through parts here that I'm gonna reference in the subsequent presentation. So what is that? Uh, I think most of you know that's a pectoral sandpiper. In particular, uh, it's a juvenile pectoral sandpiper. How do you know? Uh, one very good way to identify uh, a juvenile calidrid, which this is, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, um, is to look at, first off, how bright the feathering is. 
Uh, this bird is very bright, it's very fresh. Uh, notice also there's a certain smoothness of the breast uh, in the striations there. And then also uh, look at those uh, feather fringes. Look at how each of the feathers uh, on the wing coverts, on the scapulars, looks like it is framed or encircled. Uh, and uh, that's typical of juvenile collegiate sandpipers. Starting with the most famous part of the shorebird, uh, the bill. This one's covered in mud, uh, so it looks all dark. Uh, you can see a little bit of yellow there, which in, is in fact the base color of the bill. Uh, the auricular or the ear spot. The lore is the region between the eye and the bill. Pectoral sandpiper has a dark lore. Uh, the supercilium, this pale area over the eye, and the eye line is below it. It's comprised of the lore and then whatever line is behind the eye going to the back of the head. Here's the crown. Uh, it's very bright on this juvenile. Uh, moving on to the leg, another of the bare parts of the bird. Uh, you probably know that the actual knee of this bird is up in the plumage. Uh, and so that joint you're seeing, uh, which is the tibiotarsal articulation, that joint is actually connecting the tibia with the foot of the bird. And the foot of the bird is the tarsus, which is what the um, arrow is pointing to, and you've got the toes below it. Breast, belly, the flank, this region that runs parallel to the wing, vent area, the primary projection, you'll hear me use that term a number of times. This is the part of the uh, wing that sticks out past the tertial. So these are the, the primary feathers um, that are mm -hmm. sticking out past those long tertial feathers there. Uh, for some species I'll talk about tonight. Your bird ID workshop. Uh, somebody doesn't need to mute. Remember that genetic panelist told you about one said that the baby had SNA. When the couple found out, they, they decided to terminate the pregnancy. She didn't. I just couldn't. With parents, may I remember? All right, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, for some shorebirds that I'll talk about tonight, uh, the uh, primaries don't project past uh, the length of the tail. Um, and for some, uh, they do. The wing coverts are those feathers that are covering the wing when the bird is perched. And the scapulars are the feathers on the back of the bird. So I'll make reference to all those parts of a shorebird uh, as we move forward. <coughs> now we need to talk about plumages. In the spring, we get two kinds of shorebird plumages in Missouri. So we get basic plumage. Uh, these are birds that haven't yet molted into their alternate or breeding plumage. And we get that very bright plumage that the birds are, uh, are transitioning into. And I've said that this is simplified plumage because I'm not representing the, the, uh, the transitional plumage here. Um, of course, in uh, the springtime, you're gonna see birds that are uh, pre-alternate molt. So they're midway uh, or someplace uh, in transition between the basic plumage and, uh, and the alternate plumage. Um, I actually thought that we were going to have a seminar format tonight, and so I didn't know if we were going to, uh, I didn't know we were going to have any audience participation. Um, but uh, since we do, um, what is this, Shorebird? Volunteers? Lee Sandpiper? Uh, it's not quite a least. Sanderling? Maybe getting a little closer here. I, uh, notice the down curved bill here uh, and notice how bright the bird is. And then also notice the chevroning uh, on the breast of the, uh, uh, of the alternate. Somebody's guessing Western. Yeah, it is in fact a Western sandpiper. The reason that I uh, have chosen to, to, to use a Western sandpiper here is because I think that of all the shorebirds I'm going to represent tonight, this is the one uh, that I think has some of the most distinct uh, with plumages. Uh, so you can see how very different it is uh, between basic and al alternate. But then also the juvenile plumage, uh, which I'm not going to cover because we're only seeing that in spring. Uh, in the juvenile plumage of Western Sandpiper, a few things 
uh, are different from the alternate plumage, but one is that you can see that beautiful stripe uh, across the scap scapulars there, that red stripe. So again, I'm gonna be, sorry, I'm gonna be talking about basic plumage and alternate plumage this evening. Just a few tips for shorebirding before we move on. Uh, you gotta spend time in the field, uh, a lot of time in the field, in fact, for, uh, for shorebirding. Um, and experienced shorebirders will help you. Uh, that certainly did uh, for me. The first time that I looked at a field of shorebirds, they all looked the same to me. Uh, and that persisted for quite a while. Um, eventually, uh, as you learn more and more and you get more and more practice, you can start breaking some of those species out uh, until finally you can get just about everything that's out there. So I do recommend a spotting scope for shorebirding, but even without one, you can study the shorebirds that are closest to you. Uh, I encourage you to really watch and listen to the birds. You should observe the field marks in addition to how they behave and how they sound. Size is important, but it can be confusing or misleading, especially when birds are alone or in single species flocks. So I guess I would revise that to say that comparative size is important. So if you were to see that Western sandpiper, for instance, uh, you would note that its size is intermediate between say a leaf sandpiper and a white rump sandpiper. If you saw the Western sandpiper on its own, you might not be able to determine that. So the bare parts, bill and legs, also the eye, but I'm not gonna be talking about eyes uh, tonight, are the most frequently used field marks in short birding and they are useful. But I do think it's important not to base your IDs on bare parts alone because all bird IDs need to be based on a suite of characteristics on a combination uh, of characters. And if you were to just look at the bill, for instance, uh, and it was very long and down curved, um, you might see, for instance, a Dunlin instead of a really long billed Western sandpiper. Um, that is a confusion that does happen. If you just look at yellow legs, uh, you might confuse, say, a leaf sandpiper for a, a pectoral sandpiper, especially if you had nothing to compare the size to. So IDs need to be based on a suite of characteristics. Shorebirds can and do fly at any moment. Uh, I encourage you never to approach too closely. If the birds are noticing you at all, then you're too close to the birds. Um, it is wonderful, for instance, every time when say a peregrine flies through and all the birds go up, it's magnificent to see. Uh, it can happen at any moment. Um, and it is just as frustrating as, as it is magnificent, especially if you're on something really cool. Shorebirds establish feeding territories, even in migration. So if they fly, they may come back. You should watch them to see where they go down. Sometimes people say, or they ask me, uh, how do you see so many shorebirds? Uh, well, it's not really a secret. Uh, go during rain, uh, wait for a break in the rain and shorebird then, uh, go right after rain. This evening would have been magnificent. And I think that's one of the reasons why Paul was finding birds. Uh, when those birds are flying over our area and there's nothing to impede them, then they might go right over. But if they hit a bank of clouds, if they hit, a, if they hit rain, if they hit strong wind, then they're much more likely to go down. Photograph rarities, even experienced shorebirders make mistakes, I certainly do. And if you can't relocate a rarity for a photograph, keep in mind that it was probably a more common species. And then finally, uh, shorebird ID is a commitment. I do think it's less casually done than some other types of birding and it is important in shorebirding to learn distributions. So uh, I recommend consulting and studying uh, status and distribution of birds in Missouri, which is available at that handle. When I say distributions, I mean the dates during which you can expect certain species. All right, let's move on to some IDs. Calidrids are a large genus of typical sandpipers, which are small to medium in size. They form large flocks. They breed in the Arctic. In general, their wings are long, their bills are short, and they contain all five of the peeps, which are the smallest representatives of the genus, oftentimes thought to be the most difficult to identify. 
starting with Lee Sandpiper here, I have the basic plumage bird on the left, the alternate plumage bird on the right. This is the smallest collidrid, in fact, the smallest shorebird. You can see that uh, the bare parts are helpful on this bird. It's always gonna have yellow legs. Uh, in addition, take a look at that bill. And what I'd want you to notice there is that it is slightly decurved, curving downward, and that it comes to a fine point. That uh, curve runs along the length of the bill and is gradual. There's no sudden droop at the tip. Also, notice, and I've got an arrow pointing uh, at the tail of the basic plumage bird, that there is no primary projection. The primaries uh, are equal to the length of the tail. In basic plumage, you've got this gray-brown back. But then look at the alternate plumage bird, and you can see that it changes quite a bit. Uh, for instance, the auriculars and crown get tinged with rufous, the back becomes bright. It's got those rufous fringes. Some of those feathers have a little bit of white. Uh, the breast becomes brown. In both of these plumages, the cheek is what I would call dirty. So it's got a lot of mark on it. Right, compare that to the second peep I'm gonna talk about, semi-palmated sandpiper. You can see uh, that in breeding plumage, it's actually quite a pale bird. Uh, this one has a very white cheek. Uh, and uh, that's one way that you can distinguish this bird in, in basic plumage. The face looks quite white. Uh, the breast is in basic plumage pretty lightly marked. Uh, you can see that the legs of semi palmated sandpiper are dark. Uh, here they're blackish. Juveniles can have a sort of greenish tinge to them. Uh, Semi-palmated sandpiper is one of the peeps that uh, has the primary projection equal to the length of the tail. So there's nothing sticking out there. But I do want to call your attention, I think most importantly, to the shape of the bill. So on a semi-palmated sandpiper, you have a pretty petite bill generally. Uh, it does have a broad base, but it, look how triangular that bill is. Uh, so it's coming out uh, smoothly to a pretty bulbous tip there and uh, it is relatively small. The bird on the left is most likely a male semi-palmated sandpiper. They tend to have a, or they do have a smaller bill. Uh, the bird on the right, the alternate plumage bird, uh, is most likely a female. Uh, and you can see how that bill is longer. There is ever so slightly a droop at the tip uh, of a long semi-palmated bill. And you can see that that's the case here. Note that it does sometimes get some rufous in breeding plumage. That is variable, uh, but you can see a little bit of rufous on the scapular feathers here. You can see some in the auricular, you can see some in the crown. Also note how uh, chevroned it gets on the breast, and there is just very mild chevroning uh, along the flank of this bird, but you see very little to none at all on the flank, and especially behind the bend in the wing. Compare that to Western Sandpiper. Now this bird is rare in spring in Missouri. Uh, it is uncommon in fall, uh, but I did wanna make sure to cover it because they do occur in the spring, but also I wanted to talk about all five peeps. Uh, the most famous feature of Western Sandpiper is that long down curved bill. And what you have here in the basic plumage bird is most likely a female on the left and a male on the right. So there's no surprise when you look at that male bill on the right, that there is some overlap in length between the male Western Sandpiper bill there and the female semi-palmated Sandpiper bill. So for that reason, especially, it's important to base your idea of Western Sandpiper, sandpiper on a combination of features. You can't always count on the bill. Uh, Surely though, the bill on the left bird is distinctive. You can see again that it has a really whitish cheek and throat and breeding plumage. And you can see that the legs again are black. They're also semi-palmated by the way, which means half webbed. So just like a semi-palmated sandpiper, Western sandpiper has that partial webbing. 
Uh, you can see that in this species also, uh, that their primary projection does not extend past the tail. And what I've bracketed off there uh, is the front of the bird in front of the wing. And what I want to show you there, draw your attention to, is how front heavy this bird can seem. Doesn't it look like it's about to topple right over? And that can actually be very helpful for idea of Western sandpiper. It looks like it's going to fall forward. This is an extraordinarily beautiful collidrid in breeding plumage. Uh, you can see how rufous the auricular gets, how rufous the crown gets, uh, how much rufous there is in the scapulars. And very important here, all the chevroning running on the breast, which extends along the flank past the bend of the wing into the vent area. That can be very helpful for identifying Western sandpiper. There may be five to 10 reports of Western sandpiper uh, in the spring in Missouri. So not very many. Uh, moving on, let's talk about a larger peep. Uh, Baird sandpiper, this is the first that I'm gonna talk about that has a long primary projection. Um, I've drawn an arrow to it in both cases. Uh, Baird sandpiper, it looks stretched out. It looks very attenuated. And uh, that's because of this primary projection, uh, which again is extending past the tertials, uh, past the tail. You can see that Baird sandpiper has a uh, nearly straight, about medium length bill. In non-breeding plumage, you can see that it's quite speckled on the back. Uh, that's got these kind of black patches. Uh, and then in breeding plumage, uh, the bird brightens up a little bit and it's got those black spots, which can be a good way to help identify this bird in breeding plumage. Look at how buffy the breast gets. And there is a sort of smooth, unbroken quality between the breast uh, and the face of this bird. Legs are black. The other peep with long wings, white rump sandpiper. So it is super important not to base your ID of this bird on one feature. Uh, and sometimes people do. Um, and that is in alternate plumage, you can see I've drawn an arrow to, to it, uh, that this large sandpiper, long wing sandpiper, also has chevroning along the flank, uh, past the bend in the wing into the vent area. And I just wanna note that you can't always see it. And sometimes it is very faint. Um, so late in spring, uh, when almost all of our bared sandpipers are through the state and semi-palmated sandpiper are coming through in numbers, sometimes I'll see reports of large numbers of bared sandpiper uh, during those dates. And I think to myself, hmm, seems more likely that those are misidentified white rump sandpiper. Uh, so I, I did want to make that one note. In breeding plumage, uh, this bird shows a strong supercilium. Uh, you can see how white that line above the eye is. Uh, in both plumages, um, all the time, in fact, this bird shows a yellow spot uh, at the base of the lower bill. And uh, you can see that in both of these photos. It can be very difficult to see. You have to see the bird quite well uh, in order to ascertain that field mark. Bird's got black legs. In breeding plumage, it gets quite bright. You can see that bright uh, crown, bright auricular. You can see that it gets quite rufous on the back as well. So we'll see this bird come through in numbers in spring. Uh, the floodgates are gonna break open for white rump sandpiper probably uh, in about a week, week and a half. Uh, I've seen flocks up to 2,000, 2,500 here in Missouri. And there's the namesake feature, not actually a rump, uh, there, but the upper tail coverts of the bird, uh, which very much like a curlew sandpiper, uh, are not broken. You see a smooth white rump there. So that can help you to pick this bird out in flight. Not a peep. Pectoral sandpiper is larger, probably our most numerous shorebird here in Missouri. Uh, they do form large flocks. Uh, already at Eagle Bluffs, uh, we've had flocks of uh, 500 or more there uh, this season. Uh, it does have a long primary projection. 
uh, this bird has, uh, especially in non-breeding plumage, a primarily yellowish orange bill, which can be a good way to ID it or to actually start your ID. Um, you can see that the bill is slightly decurved. It has a bulbous tip. And the feature for which this bird is named, uh, the chest, um, is very distinctive on this bird. Uh, you can see that there's a fine margin between the belly and the chest. Bird's got yellow legs, as you can see clearly. Uh, I wanted to show you a breeding plumaged male pectoral sandpiper. And that's what we've got on the right there. You can see how black the chest gets. It's got this black chest patch. Also the bill darkens. And uh, occasionally, because that chest patch is so black and people don't expect it, this bird can be mistaken for a ruff. Uh, these, or this species does show a little bit of dimorphism in size. Uh, so um, males are significantly larger than the females. And it's important to keep that in mind. Sometimes you'll see one pectoral sandpiper that seems a lot bigger than the others. Um, again, this is a reason why sometimes they're mistaken for a rough. Uh, it's a male. Stilt, stilt sandpiper is less common in Missouri than pectoral sandpiper. It is also a calidric. Uh, we are approaching uh, the later weeks of April, and that's when we're going to start seeing uh, stilt pipers come through in some numbers, uh, but nothing approaching the number uh, of pectoral sandpiper. So in basic plumage, you can see that strong supercilium. You can see that the back is generally uh, grayish brown with some darker patches. Um, you can see how long these legs are. They're really elegant and beautiful, and they are greenish yellow. And then the most famous feature of the stilt sandpiper, of course, is that uh, down curved bill, a little longer than the length of the head, uh, coming to a pretty fine tip. It's all dark. In breeding plumage, this bird becomes very striking. You can see how brown and speckly the back gets. You can see how barred the breast and belly and vent area become uh, with those brownish bars. And then you can see uh, that distinct auricular patch, but you can also see how the supercilium becomes even more defined. I want to see if I can play a little video for you now. Let's see if it will load. What I'm wanting to show you here is the feeding behavior of stilt sandpiper. The other bird in this video is Longo Dowager, uh, for which so sandpiper can occasionally be confused. So let's see if this will play. So I'm wondering what you noticed there. Uh, what you should have seen was that both have this sewing machine-like feeding style, but uh, because a stilt sandpiper has a shorter bill, it spends a lot more time with its head submerged underwater, and the feeding style is actually more rapid than a dowager. Uh, you can also see that they both tend to prefer uh, deeper water. So moving on, you're not gonna see large numbers of sanderling in Missouri, uh, but we, you will see a few, uh, if you're lucky, coming through in the spring. Uh, in basic plumage, look at how that black eye stands out against the generally pale face. Look at how heavy the bill is, broad base coming to a bulbous tip. I've seen some sanderlings in Missouri where it does appear to me that that bill is almost as heavy as like a Western sandpiper female. They can get quite heavy. Uh, a couple of things about the basic plumage there. Uh, some of these birds will show that shoulder bar. I wonder if you see that darkening at the shoulder, that can be helpful. And then notice uh, that the edge of the wing there is dark. When this bird extends its wing, the leading edge of the wing would be dark. That's something that you see in flight on a sanderling. You also see a really nice 
beautiful white wing stripe, which I haven't shown here. Uh, and then one oddity about sand sanderling um, is that it lacks a back toe, uh, which is called the hallux of the bird, H-A-L-L-U-X. And uh, it's not there on this species. You really have to get a good look at the bird in order to ascertain that one. Uh, look what happens to this bird in breeding plumage. It's remarkable. Uh, it gets very rufous on the back, very rufous on the throat and face, this sort of unbroken redness. Uh, it is very marked here on the throat. If you were to see a bird that looked similar to this, but the throat was unmarked, uh, a little bit rusty, but unmarked, uh, you might possibly have a redneck stint, but that would be extraordinary. Uh, sometimes this bird is confused in breeding plumage for a redneck stint. Um, people don't expect sanderlings to look like this in, in breeding plumage, but in fact they do. And I have seen one that looked exactly like that at Eagle Bluffs a few Where years ago. You're really threw me through. You're in the way. There are Dunland at Eagle Bluffs right now, uh, according to Paul McKenzie's recent text to me. So, uh, and, and a number of you have seen them there uh, recently. Um, this is a very cool collegiate. In uh, basic plumage, the bird's got a relatively smooth gray back. Uh, and uh, it has a very indistinct supercilium. So those are two important things to note. Um, but of course, your eyes are always gonna be drawn to that extraordinary bill. Um, but one thing I wanna point out about that bill um, is that it's not smoothly down curved, uh, like say a leaf sandpiper bill. Um, instead, it's primarily straight, but then droops abruptly near the tip. And I think you can see that here. The bird does have in breeding plumage, some of that uh, chevroning, um, it doesn't really go much past the base of or the bend in the wing. Um, legs are black and you're not seeing a lot of tibia here. Uh, so uh, this is a pretty short bird. It can seem squat. Uh, in alternate plumage, the bird gets quite rufous. You can see that the auricular particular, wow, that's a nice rhyme for you. The auricular in particular, uh, it gets, it becomes sort of like a reddish spot there. Um, and then, of course, the most famous feature of the alternate plumage dowager is that wonderful black belly that it develops. Um, I've got a flight photo of, oh, I think I said dowager there. I've got a flight photo of uh, a Dunlin in the upper right-hand corner here, and I just want, I do want to draw your attention to um, how it does have that split rump. Where do you want to go, Biscuit? Let's move on from collidrids entirely and talk about Tringa sandpipers. So uh, this is a genus of medium to large sandpipers with long-legged elegant appearance. Uh, they contain yellow-legged shanks and tattlers. The breeding range is generally more southerly than colligid, so you've got some of them uh, breeding in actually uh, North America, uh, in the north uh, of the United States and also in Canada. Uh, in general, the feeding style of Tringa is to pick up food or capture prey and then take a few steps and repeat this motion. So you'll see them running after their prey. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of lesser yellow legs at Eagle Bluffs doing that right now. In Missouri, at least, their calls are distinctive. So for this section of my presentation, I'm going to play the Tringa Sandpiper calls for you. Starting with Solitary Sandpiper, what a weird bird. Um, you're not going to see large concentrations of solitary sandpiper really ever, um, but you will see them breaking the rule of their name. Um, so you'll see more than one solitary sandpiper Big together. Outside. And the name uh, is, is really meant to draw your attention to the fact that these birds filter through in small numbers, um, and they're headed up to Canada to actually nest in trees, which I think is super cool. Uh, if you really want to find them, you can check stagnant pools. Um, they like that more than other sandpipers, um, but you'll also see them on mud flats interspersed. As far as the appearance of this bird, uh, you can see that it has relatively clean white flank, dark brown back with white spots on it. Uh, it has a smooth striated breast. The legs are greenish. The bill is about the length of the head with some yellow at the base. And the most distinctive feature of this species is 
that complete white iron. Uh, the other errors I've drawn here are meant to call your attention to a behavior of this bird. It does tend to bob its head, which can help to distinguish it from a species that can look similar, spotted sandpiper, which tends to bob its tail. The call of solitary sandpiper is that shrill wheat wheat at the same level, the same pitch. By far the most numerous tringa sandpiper we have in Missouri is lesser yellow legs, uh, coming through in both the spring and the fall. Uh, you can see on this bird, this is super important, that the length of the bill is about the width of the head. It also comes to a fine tip. Uh, this bird in breeding plumage has very little barring on the flank uh, and will show very little and no barring past the, uh, or no barring past the bend in the wing. Uh, the back is mottled with gray and some darker gray, almost brownish and speckled with white. And then uh, I've drawn your attention, of course, to the yellow legs and then to the primary projection of this bird. So one way to tell lesser yellow legs from greater yellow legs that isn't commonly discussed has to do with primary projection. Uh, this bird has wings that extend past the tail when folded. It's one of the great sounds of springtime. And uh, you can hear that they give out these pip, pip, pip calls, and sometimes they string them together. So they do this kind of warbling. I've got a greater yellow legs in basic plumage and alternate plumage here. Um, on the basic plumage bird, I've marked that it does have uh, primaries that don't extend past the length of the tail. The back is generally brownish, although finely speckled. Uh, look how long that bill is. So it's broader, it's thicker, it's longer. Uh, you can see that it is bicolored, much more so than say lesser yellow legs. And it does appear to angle upward about two thirds of the way toward the tip. In breeding plumage, the legs can darken a little bit, uh, but the most significant difference is just how barred this bird becomes, much more so than in lesser yellow legs. So you can see that heavy barring on the flank back into the vent area, lesser yellow legs isn't gonna show it to that degree. You can hear how strident that call is, uh, and it does descend uh, in a series of three or four notes. I did want to just put up a lesser yellow legs next to a greater yellow legs. And you can see all the differences that uh, I just mentioned there. Uh, one thing that I'll note um, also that was on the slide, but I didn't mention has to do with behavior. So both of these birds chase prey through wetlands, but lesser yellow legs tends to do it in a more relaxed fashion. Greater yellow legs can really run around like a madman. Um, they really do tend to dart or lurch uh, and it can be very fun to watch. The last trend of sandpiper I'm gonna talk about it is a willet, the largest of the birds uh, that I'll mention. This bird is sometimes confused with greater yellow legs, uh, but you can see that there are a number of differences, primarily the bill. Uh, look at how thick that bill is and it is all dark. Uh, the bird is generally a pale gray, but it does have some light barring on the breast and flank uh, with a little bit of rufous brown. The legs are not yellow at all, but in fact, a kind of cold bluish gray. And then when the bird opens its wings, it's like it takes on another character entirely. Uh, it's the most wonderful thing to see. And you can see this pattern on a willet from a great distance when it flaps. Uh, so you can see that black and white there, not just in the wing, uh, but also the tail. So I'm actually not sure if that bird on the right is a Western or an Eastern willet, uh, but the bird on the left is definitely Western, um, which is the subspecies that we get here in Missouri.
So the name of the species willet is actually, it's an onomatopoeia. Uh, it um, reminds us of that call, uh, which is transliterated sometimes as wee willy willet. Not a trinket sandpiper, but closely related is spotted sandpiper. I did want to make sure to cover this one since they are so common. Uh, and uh, you can see on the spotted sandpiper that it's got that almost entirely orange bill. It's got a strong supercilium. Uh, it is generally brown on the back. Legs are pale orange. And it is so spotted uh, in this breeding plumage here. Uh, the arrows at the back of the bird uh, just meant to draw your attention to a behavior. This bird compulsively bobs its tail pretty much all the time. With practice, you can learn to distinguish the call of the spotted sandpiper from a solitary sandpiper. So I'll play spotted sandpiper for you. So I wonder if you can hear how it's descend it descends in pitch. So it's a peat wheat, peat wheat, and then listen to solitary. It's just very useful to know these calls because you'll hear them when you're in Missouri wetlands. I love this topic, dowager identification. Uh, it's famously difficult, it tricks even experienced birders and it certainly does trick me. Uh, I like how hard it is in fact. Um, Bill length can be suggestive of the species, but it's never diagnostic. And that's because uh, in particular, uh, there is in, uh, an average of uh, longer bills in females of these species and shorter bills in males. So there's overlap uh, between the bill length of the male long bill dowager and the female short bill dowager. Dates of occurrence can be helpful, but the method isn't foolproof. So we're actually in, uh, today is an important date for Dowager because it's the date when we can start to expect short bill Dowager, uh, April 20th. Any date uh, of occurrence for short bill Dowager prior to this date would require documentation with the MBRC. Uh, so for the next few weeks, um, look at your Dowager especially closely because you could have either species. The best practice for non-breeding birds is to use long billed short bill uh, dowager to call them one or the other, uh, unless you clearly hear the birds call. And then uh, if you don't hear the birds call, then you, your site idea of dowager really needs to be based on a suite of characteristics. Um, so you have to look at a number of different things in order to identify dowager. Uh, never base it on uh, one or even two, I would say, characteristics. Look at the whole of the bird. Otherwise, you should list short bill, long bill, dowager. A lot of known field marks are confusing. Two of those are the hunched versus flat back. Uh, so it's sometimes said, well, it's often said that long bill, dowager have a hunched or humped back. Short bill, dowager have a flat back. Um, they can both kind of resemble those appearances uh, in various postures. Also the color of feather fringes, it's sometimes said that uh, long billed dowager has a white feather fringe in breeding plumage, short bill has an orange one. Um, I don't find that particularly helpful because I think it's difficult to determine if a bird is in full breeding plumage yet or not. Long billed dowager is monotypic, but short billed dowager has three subspecies in Missouri. We get uh, Henderson eye or prairie. There are two long billed dowager at Eagle Bluffs right now. They are in transitional plumage. Uh, they've been there for a couple weeks. Um, may still be there on Saturday, we'll see. Uh, but there probably will also be some more dowager there on Saturday. Uh, I'll be hopeful. Um, take a look at this bird in breeding plumage. There are just a few things, um, actually a number of things that I wanna draw your attention to. Uh, Let's start with the rear of the bird and on long billed dowager, uh, those primaries are not gonna extend past the tail tip. You can see in this photo, in fact, they're a little bit short of the tail tip. Um, 
Just cautiously, I want to draw your attention to this field mark, which I do find useful, but primarily in photographs. And that's the shape of the fringe uh, on the lower scapular uh, and on the wing coverts. Um, so you can see exactly where I have that arrow pointing that there are those two white lobes on that feather and that the white does not extend further up the length of the feather. And that is a distinctive uh, feature for long-billed doucher and breeding plumage. When I show you short-billed doucher in a minute, you'll see how the white um, actually frames the feather much further up. I have actually drawn a, an, an arrow to the hunched or humped uh, posture of this doucher. Um, that's not diagnostic, but it can be suggestive. Approaching the front of the bird, one of the newer uh, advances in doucher identification has to do with something called laurel angle, um, which is a mouthful, um, but it's just the angle of the lore uh, in relation to the bill. Um, and here, I would just call your attention to how parallel that lore is to the bill. Um, so you can see how it, it runs almost as an extension of the bill there to the eye. Look at the bill itself. It's about twice the length of the head, it can be a little longer than this. And uh, it has a flat tip. Now this one has a little bit of water at the end of the tip, but you can see that the, the, it's angled, but it's flat. The foreneck of the bird is marked. The most famous feature of breeding plumage dowager has to do with the sides of the breast. And here you can see that there are these bars on the side of the breast, and that's opposed to speckling or spotting that you'll see on short-billed dowager. Long-billed dowager is in general a larger bird than short-billed dowager, not by much, um, and it's also taller. So on long-billed dowager, you see more of the tibia than you do on a short-billed dowager. And then uh, drawing your attention to the base color of the bird itself, it is a deeper orange than short-billed dowager, and there is more orange in the vent area. I would caution you uh, that both dowager species show barring behind the bend in the wing, and it's not a useful field mark. What you want to do is look in front of the bend in the wing on the side of the breast to, uh, to determine whether you see sp spotting or barring. Uh, but that's not always dis as distinct as you'd want it to be. And so you need to, again, use a suite of characters when identifying doucher. It is helpful to see the birds fly uh, or to see them raise their wings. The underwing coverts of long-billed doucher are less marked. They're just less busy than short-billed doucher, especially at the front of the wing where you can see that white patch. And then when the bird takes off and you can see the tail and the back, I wonder if you can notice how the tail contrasts with the back coverts there. That's because the width of the barring uh, of black in the tail is equal to, um, or as a matter of fact, much thicker than the white barring. Long-billed doucher feeding, it's much different than the call of short-billed doucher. It looks quite similar, doesn't it? It can be a really hard ID, uh, especially if the birds aren't seen well. Uh, a couple things about this bird. Uh, uh, let's start with the bill. It does tend to be shorter, but again, I wanna caution you that that's not always a reliable field mark. Um, but look at the tip. Do you see how lobed that tip is? It's not flat. And you can actually see that in the field if you are able to see the bird well and look closely. Uh, the bill is thicker uh, in general and the forehead is steeper. So sometimes said to have kind of a ski jump forehead. And then look at that lure much less parallel to the bill. Uh, it's angled up. So look at the throat. It is less marked than long-billed doucher, that foreneck. Uh, it tends, it's cleaner. I've drawn your attention to the spotting on the side of the breast there as opposed to the barring. 
The back does tend to be flatter. I've already talked about my caution on that field mark. And then look at, this, at the fringes on the scapulars, exactly as I just told you. You see how it frames the scapular feathers uh, and the uh, lower wing coverts. The uh, primaries do extend uh, usually a little bit past the tip of the tail, um, or they'll be even to even with the tip of the tail, but oftentimes past it. Uh, the bird is generally lighter underneath than long-billed dowager and has less color in the vent area. And then you can see how it contrasts with long-billed dowager uh, when it's in flight. Look how busy and how well marked the underwing is, and look at the absence of contrast between the back coverts and the tail. Uh, and that's because the width of the white barring on the tail is greater than or equal to the width of the black barring. So here's the call of the short billed dowager. All right, so here's a test. I'm kind of throwing you into the deep end a little bit here, but that's a transitional dowager. Uh, thoughts on which one that is? No. You got it. That's a long-billed dowager. You can see, for instance, that there is a little bit of emergent barring on the side of the breast. Uh, but also, look at how parallel that lore is to the bill. Look how long the bill is. It's got a flat tip. You can see even in the transi this transitional plumage that the foreneck is well marked. Also, this is a tall bird. Look how much of the tibia is showing. Uh, and the back of the bird does look rather hunched. What about this one? Monticello has played a cruel trick on you. Not a dowager at all, right? That's actually a transitional curly sandpiper. Uh, but the base color of the belly of that bird and the breast of that bird can look like a dowager. That species has been seen three times in Missouri that we know of. Also not a dowager. It's a Wilson snipe, uh, which I wanna talk about next. Look how chicken-like this bird is. It's got a short tail. Uh, it has these very distinct stripes on the back. Uh, it's got that ski jump forehead. The bill is rather long with a flat tip, not unlike uh, long billed doucher, but it's got a lot of other differences from that species. Look at how barred the breast is uh, and all the way into the vent area. Legs are pale yellow. This bird is sometimes confused with doucher, but not for long uh, because it is so distinct from it. It's also sometimes confused with American woodcock. But of course, the habitats of these species are quite different. Um, and on the woodcock, you can see that it's got a clean forehead. It's got this wedge-shaped bill. Uh, the uh, stripes on the back are broad and gray, and it has no barn. This is a great sound. You hear it especially in the fall, but you will hear it sometimes in the spring. Inevitably, when a Wilson snipe flush, flushes, uh, it will make that sound. So let me see where we are in time. Oh, I think it's time to wrap up. <laughs> so that's about as much as I'll get through today. 8.07. Let's do some questions. Got any questions, just ask, unless you want to type it in the chat and then I'll read them, but however you want to do it. No questions. Everybody knows everything about shorebirds now, Pete. Good job. I'll ask a question, Pete. It's sure. Lottie. Hi, Lottie. Hi. So when, you, when you're in eBird and putting these in and seeing some, um, Tell me again the ones that make up the peeps. So if I, that's a peep spa. Right. Um, so 
in eBird, if you're not sure of the shorebird you're looking at, uh, you generally want to use the designation shorebird spa. But if it's a small bird uh, and you know that it belongs to the small colligerous, um, then you can use the uh, you can use the designation peep spa. Um, I think it's most often used when you're seeing uh, quite a small shorebird um, and you can't distinguish, say, between a leaf sandpiper or a semi palmated sandpiper, or you can't distinguish between a bared sandpiper, sandpiper or a, a white rump sandpiper. So those are the four species. And then the, uh, the, the fifth one is the Western sandpiper, which again is rare in spring. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Quick question. Yeah. This is Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. Said it's down at Eagle Bluffs this evening and seeing lots of shorebirds, but my schedule, I usually go in the morning. So if I go tomorrow morning, what's my chances of seeing a good variety of shorebirds? Yeah, that's a great question. So shorebirds do tend to migrate at night. Um, they're not alone among um, bird orders and families for doing that. Um, so the evening um, can be a good time actually to see shorebirds. Uh, they are sort of starting to get active, starting to stage and thinking about taking off. Um, but the best time uh, it, for, for my money uh, to go oftentimes um, is early in the morning, right at daybreak. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's a lot of the, the, of the time when I go. And that's because those birds, um, a lot of them have uh, come down and are resting. Um, but you can see shorebirds all day this time of year. Uh, because as I said, they're establishing territories, they're feeding, they're building up their reserves. Um, for instance, those two long-billed dowch are at Eagle Bluffs. They've been there for a couple of weeks now. Um, and it's probably the case that many of the shorebirds that people are seeing at Eagle Bluffs um, have been there for an extended period, just continuing to build up their energy. Um, as far as, if you're wanting to see those fowler up, I don't know, uh, just because I've seen them drop down in groups like that of 30, and a lot of times they don't stay long. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is, um, but you might get lucky. Okay, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Any other questions? Well, thanks again, Pete, for taking the time to go over some of the short spring shorebirds here in Missouri and Boone County. Uh, you got it, Jim. We got to everything. I added Fowler up at the last minute and we didn't get to it, but we got to everything but the Fowler up. So uh, that's, that's okay, I guess. Uh, I'd like to speak up here uh, as a thank you, Pete, for Missouri Birding Society and working with Columbia Audubon Society and encourage all of you, don't be intimidated by so many possibilities. And just like anything, work with these one at a time. Just you know, get one of these down pat, like Lee Sandpiper has yellow legs until it gets mud on it. <laughs> but work it through and don't be intimidated by the possibilities just work through getting one bird at a time. And I want to remind all of you that uh, on May 23rd, there will be a Zoom-based workshop on the flycatchers of Missouri presented by Tim Barksdale. And you will be getting more information on that later. So uh, keep that in mind. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Edge. And, and thanks for that point. Um, Edge, of course, is absolutely right uh, that um, as I was telling you at the beginning of the presentation, um, the more you study these birds, the more you'll be able to, uh, to start breaking out species of birds that look uh, very similar. Um, and, and once you start, say, to be able to identify at least sandpiper with some facility, um, then you'll always be able to do that. And then you can move on to others. Just a reminder, the field trip is this Saturday, starting at 3 o'clock. Um, meet at the McBain Trailhead of the Katy Trail. For those of you who don't know where McBain is, it's off um, Route K. If you know where the Burr Oak 
is on Baroque Road in Columbia. The, if you're coming from Columbia, the McBain Trailhead is a couple of miles before you get to the Baroque. Um, for those of you that aren't into shorebirds but want to see spring migrants, um, we're also having a field trip on Sunday starting at eight o'clock to Prairie Garden Trust, which is um, in Callaway County. Uh, the carpool will meet at eight o'clock at Mosier's Fo Food on, on uh, Keene Street here in Columbia. So if you wanna, if you wanna, if you're sick of shorebirds, you don't wanna do shorebirds, but you wanna do potentially warblers and tanagers and things like that, you can go on that field trip or, you know, if you like a variety, you can do both. So if anybody doesn't have anything to add, I'll go ahead and conclude the program again. Thanks, Pete, for um, taking the time. Glad Michelle could lend you her computer. So, thanks. It was a pleasure. Good to see all of you. Okay. See you on Saturday. Bye. Thanks a lot, Pete. Thank you. Bye.